On today's episode of A Measure of Faith, I'm your host, Jacob Jones, and I plan to share with you the amazing, miraculous story of how God called me to ministry and revealed himself to me. It is my prayer that by sharing my story with you, it will increase your measure of faith. If you've ever asked yourself, is God real? Is there more to life? Are miracles possible? Then you're in the right place. Thank you for joining us today on this podcast. Here's your host, Jacob Jones, pastor of River City Pentecostals in Decatur, Alabama, hoping to increase your measure of faith with inspirational stories and the truth of God's word. Hey there, welcome to our first episode of A Measure of Faith. I'm so glad that you decided to join me today. Uh, It tells me that you're hungry for truth because I don't think you would be listening to this if you weren't. And uh, that gets me excited because I'm a person that loves the truth. And I love when someone is hungry and passionate about finding the truth. I truly believe that if you are hungry for the truth, you'll find it. You'll find it. So many people... I've heard, you know, skeptics, atheists, agnostic people who will say, you know, I, I, um, I need evidence. I need to see proof before I'll believe. And, and to me, that's always, it's a little bit uh, of an interesting ask when, when you say I, I need evidence, but you don't go to you don't go to the side of the crime. Like it's, it's like the investigator of, of a criminal case, uh, some crime that takes place. Detective is like, you know what? I need evidence, but I'm going to sit here at my desk and wait till it comes to me. And that's always, always kind of been a little bit humorous to me when someone's like, uh, I'll believe in God when he proves himself to me. And it's like, you know, why don't you go look for the evidence? And, um, it's, it, I really do believe, uh, you'll find it for me. Um, I grew up, my grandfather was very, uh, very spiritual. He, he was a preacher. Um, he was a Pentecostal preacher in some independent churches and he, uh, he had done a little bit of pastoring, a lot of, a lot of preaching. I remember as a kid growing up, like they would pick us up. And we would sit underneath a pew and I would draw or play with toy cars or something. But it was never, it was never about me. Like I didn't, I I never really, I remember Sunday school lessons and I liked some of the things we did in Sunday school, snack time, juice boxes, all that stuff. But church was never something that, you know, it just didn't click that, hey, I'm supposed to get something more out of this than, um, you know, than some, some sugar and, and good stories. Um, it wasn't until I was about 12 years old that that happened. And a lady, young lady came and asked my mother, uh, we were living in the projects at the time. She came, knocked on our door. Her mom and my mom uh, were friends for a long time. They, we knew I knew who she was, um, but uh, she was, you know, she said, "Hey, I want to, I want to take your two kids to to church if if you'll let me." You know, my mom wasn't going to church at the time, but she said, "Hey, you know, maybe your kids will come," and and that's you know, would that be okay? My mom came and asked, "Do you want to go to church?" This was the first time that anyone had ever asked me, "Do you want to go?" You know, when my grandparents went, if I was with my grandparents, I didn't get a choice. I went with them. If my mom ever went to church, like I didn't get a choice. I went with her. Uh, I was told to go to church. This is the first time that I was ever asked, will you go to church? I was 12 years old and I was, you know, I'm kind of sitting there like I'm bored. I can't remember exactly what I was doing that day. I remember I was in my room. And I remember just thinking, sure, why not? So we went. I had never had 
a headache in my life at this point. I didn't know what a headache was. I was 12 years old, never had migraine problems or headaches or anything like that. I still never really do. And on the way to the church that Sunday night, my head was hurting so bad. Looking back now, I know what was happening. You know, that was spiritual warfare. That was a spirit of infirmity trying to keep me from being involved at all in that service because it was a pivotal moment in my life. So I, I'm 12 years old. I go to this service, never had a headache before. And then all of a sudden I have one. What a coincidence, right? And I mean, it was like a really bad, like sensitive to light and sound. I went in and I didn't really know anyone there besides my sister. She ran off and sat with a friend that she knew there. And I just kind of went and sat by myself about halfway up the right side of the church. And I put my head, uh, forehead down into my hand, leaned against the side of the pew and just tried to endure the whole service because there was a lot of loud noises. It was bright in there and my head was hurting and I'd never experienced this before. So I was like, man, why did I sign up for this? I should have just stayed home. Um, I didn't get anything out of the music. It was hurting my head. I didn't get anything out of the preaching. I could not tell you what was spoken that night. And uh, at the end of the service, Pentecostal services, if you've ever been to one, they, they have an altar call. And they were calling for people to come to the altar. And I just remember thinking like, okay, I know I've been in this kind of service before. This is the end. And I'm, I'm close to being able to go home and turning off all the lights in my room and not having to deal with this pain. So I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm at the finish line now. A young man um, walks up to me. I still remember his name was David Miller. He walks up and he's, he says, I kind of remembered him from when, Sometimes we occasionally visited that church to go to Sunday school. So I knew of him at that point. I didn't really know him well. Um, But he comes up to me and says, hey, do you want to go up to the front and pray? And, And I said, no, man, my head's hurting really bad. And he said, you know what? We can have some of the ministers pray for your head. And the pain can go away. Now... I don't know if I truly believe that or not, but it was not a strange thing to me because my grandfather very much believed in miracles. He very much believed in faith. And he, you know, before he would run to the medicine cabinet or try to take us to the hospital, he would go grab a bottle of oil and put it on us and pray for us. So, I mean, growing up, that was a normal thing for me to have an elder come and, and, anoint you with oil and pray for you so it wasn't a strange thing to me so I said you know what let's do it because I'm I'm in a lot of pain right now and I, nothing else I have no other choice like I don't have any kind of medicine for this my mom's not here like I'm just I don't know anyone I don't know what to do so let's go and I, I went up to the front some elder um men came and kind of circled around me. They got a bottle of oil and they put it on my forehead, laid their, their hand, their fingers on my forehead and began to pray for me. And a couple of them took my hands and lifted my hands up. And right about that time, the headache went away. And I remember thinking, wow, Thank you, God, for taking that pain away. And I knew, like, there was no other reason. Like, I got closer to the noise. I was, you know, I went up to the front where there was more light, more things to make my head hurt, and then my head stopped hurting. Like, that didn't, like, my logical brain was like, this, I mean, that must have been whatever it is. I'm going to thank God for it. So I'm like, thank you. God for this and right about that time my lips began to move on their own they were kind of quivering but it wasn't because I was cold this this was not a I wasn't cold there it but it was like 
if you had jumped in a cold bath and your lips just started quivering on their own uncontrollably. It scared me because I'm like, what I'm what's happening now? Like, this is new. Uh, so I, I stopped it. I didn't let it go any further. But I knew something happened. It was enough to really get my attention, right? My headache is gone. My lips are moving on their own. I'm 12 years old. This is the first time anything like this has happened. Um, so I, I, from that experience, I finally, I, I woke, I woke up like I was no longer the kid underneath the pew playing with cars and drawing. Like for the first time I was like, is there a God? Did he just heal me? Was that him that I felt? What was that? Right? So those questions led me to, well, if there is a God, then how do I know this God that these people worship? How do I know the the one my grandfather preaches about is the right God? And and I, I remember starting to dig into this at that age. And I've always been a very skeptical person, logical thinker. Um, I work in IT now. I'm, I'm a very, you know, I consider myself to have a very good, like, critical thinking um type brain and so i just remember thinking this you know if god is real and if the god of the bible is real and there's thousands of different denominations like they all disagree with each other how is it possible that you know this you know if this god is real how do I, like what are the chances that the one that my grandfather preaches about is is the right god and so i started digging into it and my grandfather a lot, a lot of times he would preach in these small churches out in the country up on the mountain somewhere very few people there like max like 40 people you know a hundred on a good night um and i'm thinking like I have friends that go to churches with hundreds of people, thousands of people, like huge churches. And not only that, like they're from churches that there are multiple, there's a lot of them. Like I only know one or two churches that preach what my grandfather preaches. And he has some things that are very different than what a lot of other people preach. So, I started digging into it and I actually dug into it with the intention initially to prove my grandfather wrong. I didn't tell him that, I didn't tell anyone what I was doing. I just, I went to the Bible and I started by saying, well, I got to have some sort of foundation. I'm just going to assume, all right, the Bible is true. Start from that assumption because lots of people believe that. But then I'm going to take some things that the majority of Christians believe that are contrary to what my grandfather believes. And I'm going to put, pit those things against each other. And basically, you know, I'm going to prove that my grandfather can't possibly be preaching things that are correct. Because it, it it's just very unlikely that thousands of people are going to agree, you know, with all of my friends in high school and all the other people that I know. And then like a few dozen people are going to agree with my grandfather. Very, it's very unlikely. My grandfather is going to be the one who is, uh, who has the truth. So armed only with an experience in a Pentecostal church. And I knew the doctrine that my grandfather taught. I mean, he gave me a Bible and underlined certain things in it and tell me things that we're going to dive into in this podcast, things that are contrary to what many Christians believe. And I thought there's no way it could be right. And as I dug into it, I realized, well, actually the Bible does seem to support what he believes. And in my efforts to prove it wrong, I began to believe in things like, 
for example, receiving the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. A lot of churches don't believe that that's necessary. Some don't believe that it even ever happens. Um, and if it does happen, then it's like it's a one-off thing. But as I began to look at Scripture, it was like it became very apparent to me that it happened every single time someone got the Holy Ghost. And it also became very apparent to me that the Bible is very clear that you need to have the Holy Ghost. So, if we're just assuming the Bible is correct, just with a unbiased reading of the Bible, in fact, trying to prove <laughs> trying to prove it wrong, I became very, uh, very confident that. My grandfather actually wasn't wrong about some things, and one of those things was with stammering lips and another tongue. Like the Bible says, you know, that's how God is going to pour out of his, his spirit. So now that I know this, now I'm like, okay, well, I want that. So I wanted to go get baptized, which is another thing we'll talk about in this podcast. Well, well how are you supposed to be baptized? Does it matter? Um, I believe it does. We'll talk about that. And later episodes. Um, so I go get baptized. And then after quite some time. Um, I kept getting to that place where I had stammering lips. And then finally on October the 15th year uh, 2000. When I was 14 years old. I began to speak in a language that I didn't. No one taught me. I didn't understand it. And I remember uh, when that took place and I'll tell you more about the details of that in another podcast as well I'm trying to um, keep this under an hour hopefully um, and if I go off on all these rabbit trails we could we could be here for a long time but I will come back on some of these certain things like the night that I got the Holy Ghost and we'll dive into that in a later episode but I get the Holy Ghost 14 years old for six months, it took me two years to get this, right? Because I got baptized at 12. Two years of going to service after service, get get the Holy Ghost finally. And I thought at 14 years old, I'm like, I don't want to lose this. It took me so long to get it. Uh, that's just the way I thought about it then. And so because of that, I, I said, I want to get this every day. So I would go to my room and plant my head in this beanbag that I had in the corner. And I would pray until I spoke in tongues every day. I did that for six months from October until around my birthday when I was about to be 15 years old. Um, I had a dream after six months straight of like making sure that I prayed every day until I spoke in tongues. I had a dream. Now, this was significant because... I can tell you even now, I'm 36 years old, I can count on one hand how many dreams I've had in my life. If I'm honest, it's probably, it's, it's, it's probably less than that. Now, I know what you're saying, everybody has dreams, you just don't remember them. Okay, sure. I've had dreams every night for 36 years, and I've remembered less than a handful of, like, however you want to say it, I don't. I sleep so dead. Like, I close my eyes and boom, I wake up the next morning. Every night. This was the first time in my life that I, that that didn't happen. I, I went to sleep and I went into a dream. The dream was so real. It's It was more real than this room I'm sitting in now, this microphone in front of me. Like, it was so real. And I knew, without a shadow of a doubt, I knew after this happened that it was from God. But that scared me. In the dream, um, I was sitting in a, a, a large auditorium. And there was a man who was preaching to all of us. There were like a couple thousand people in there being preached to. And amongst these hundreds of people, he starts he says there's someone here that God has given a great mission and 
You know who you are. And instantly, I knew he was talking about me, just when he said that. But I didn't go. He said, I want you to come up to the front. And I was like, I'm not going up there. I ha- and I know now how long it took me to go up there was signifying my hesitation and accepting my calling. But I didn't know that then. In the dream, I waited. I mean, he started describing it. He's, I mean, at first it was very vague. Like it could have been more than one person in that man. Eventually it started getting so specific that people around me began to turn and look at me and say, I'm pretty sure he's talking about you, right? That's you, right? Um, it became unavoidable to the point where I was like, okay, he's talking about me. So I went up to the front. He called some other ministers together around me. Um, in the dream and they all began to pray for me and I began to speak in tongues in the dream and then I opened my eyes as they were praying for me I opened my eyes and I was sitting up straight in my bed in my room looking at the wall in my bedroom still speaking in tongues I closed my eyes and I was back in the dream and I went I remember opening closing my eyes a couple times going back and I couldn't tell if my bedroom was the dream or if the sanctuary where those men were praying for me was the dream, it was, I, they were both so real that it almost felt like my room was the dream until I finally like came to and realized, wait, Oh, I'm in my room. I'm in my bed. Oh, okay. And then my alarm clock went off right then. And I snapped to went to school Didn't really tell anyone. I think I maybe mentioned to like one person, like, man, I had a weird dream. But I didn't really, I didn't tell people what I knew to be true, which was that God gave me a dream. (laughs) And like, I, I kept that to myself. And the reason why was one, I, it scared me Two, if I told people that, then it became real. Like someone might be like, oh, well. Now you've got to do something like I didn't want that. Um, I didn't want someone to basically confirm it. Like I didn't want that confirmation. Like I wanted it to just be like, I can question this forever, I guess. Like I just, so I kind of kept it to myself. It was almost two years later. I felt like I had successfully suppressed that I thought about it all the time, but I thought, you know, I'm just going to keep suppressing this until, you know, it goes away. I don't want to tell anyone about it. I'm just, you know, so I'm sitting in church and my pastor is preaching. He's walking back and forth on the platform. I can still see it in my mind today. It's like etched in my brain. He's pacing back and forth. He's preaching about calling and purpose on your life and because he's preaching about that subject I remember the dream and I'm like I I remember in my mind when I remember the dream I remember saying it's just a dream just forget about it pay attention to what he's preaching about just I kind of tried to suppress it again right then and there and He stopped pacing mid-stride, mid-sentence. And after what seemed like two or three minutes of silence, he turned, it may have only been five seconds, but it felt like an eternity. He turned and starts walking right towards me. He reaches out his hand. I'm on the second row. He reaches over the first row and reaches out his hand to me. I instinctively kind of take it almost like we're going to shake hands or something. But he, when he takes my hand, he pulls me up off of my seat, points his finger right in my, my nose. And he says, God gave you a dream. You just tried to tell yourself it wasn't from him. You keep trying to forget about it. You say it's not from God, but the dream was from God. And he's given you a great mission. And he went on to say some other things that I kind of 
keep to myself. Maybe one day I'll share them. But it was more about more details about the mission. But the fact that he said, number one, I had a dream, which he didn't know about. No one did. And that God has given me a great mission, which is what I was told in the dream. Like that to me kind of confirmed. And plus, I was literally just sitting there thinking like, oh, man, I got to forget about this dream. How do I? It wasn't. It was just a dream. I kept, I was actively trying to suppress that dream when he stopped and came over and told me that. Um, that to me was like, all right. It did a couple things. One, it confirmed to me that the dream was from God because how else would he tell me that he didn't this wasn't like if you're out there skeptical and you're like oh he probably just goes up to everyone and says that no this was very abnormal like in all my years of going to church I've never seen a pastor walk off a platform and tell somebody God gave you a dream like I've never seen that before this so the chances of that the one time that that happened was to someone that did have a dream that they were questioning to be or not to be from God at the very moment that he told me that, like, that's just too much coincidence for my mind, but okay. If you're still skeptical, let's keep going. So one, it confirmed to me, even if that story alone doesn't confirm to you, it confirmed to me that God had a calling and a purpose for my life. But the second thing it did was it put a lot of pressure on me at 16 years old. Because at from that point forward, I felt like everyone was watching. I had people come up to me after that service. Oh, I knew God had a purpose for you. I just knew it. I felt it, you know. And then all of a sudden it was like I was like a zoo animal. Like everyone's like waiting for me to do some great, awesome thing. Like call fire down from heaven I'm like, I'm a poor kid from the projects. Like, I, I didn't expect very much from myself. I didn't think that anyone at all expected much from me. So when God tells me you have a great mission, I'm like, you got the wrong guy. And then when other people are like, oh, yes, I knew this. I'm like, did you know this? Like, I'm questioning everything. And the pressure now is on. That pressure eventually built up to the point where... I realized if I'm going to keep going to church, I can't keep living for God and denying this calling at the same time. Like I have, I either have to accept the calling and stay in church or I have to get out of church. I can't be in church and deny this calling because the pressure was just too, too much. Eventually it led to me running from God, running away from God, trying to be someone I wasn't so God would leave me alone. That's another story. But for eight years, I didn't go to church. I didn't. I joined the Marine Corps, uh, got stationed in uh, about 2,000 miles away from where I grew up in San Diego, California. I grew up in Alabama. I was stationed in San Diego, California, 2,000 miles away from my hometown, made all new friends in the military, had no friends from my past like I had a new life I married I got married uh, to a woman who had no idea about that dream or the calling or any of my previous religious experiences I didn't share that with anyone in my new future life um, or new present life uh, I should say like they didn't know anything about my past like no one did I didn't share that with not one person not even my closest friends because even my closest friends I acted as if I had always been how I was right then and there, which was, you know, I, I became, I, I, you know, I did a lot of stuff that a preacher wouldn't do. Let's just say that. And I acted as if that's how I always was. They had no idea that I was running from a calling. I didn't want people to know because then they might ask the question of like, why are you running? Are you ever going to go back? I didn't want to face those questions, so I just never told anyone at all. So one day, uh, to kind of keep a long story short, I won't give all the details about how I started going back to church, but basically it was my wife that got me to go back. 
when and maybe I'll share the details of that in a different podcast because it's it's a pretty cool story. But my wife gets me to go to church and um it isn't it isn't long before I start feeling instantly like God is saying you're you still have a calling. I still did not tell my wife about my past. I did not tell my new pastor of like two weeks that I had this dream or I told no one anything still. I still kept all that to myself because I still had this hope that I'll come back to church. My soul will be saved, but I won't be expected to, you know, do some great mission because I still don't think I can do that. I still didn't expect much from myself. So if I don't tell anyone about my past, don't tell anyone about the dream, we can just keep going on as if that never happened. That was kind of my thinking. Um, but it wasn't God's. He kept, I felt like he was constantly reminded me of the dream, constantly reminded me of my calling and my purpose. I couldn't stop thinking about it. But at this point now, I could say, well, but God, like, you can't use me now. Look at what all I've done. And out of nowhere, I get a text from an old friend who knew me in my past life, who's now pastoring in Alabama. And he just simply sends a message to me, actually sent it to me on Facebook. He just said Romans eleven twenty nine, and didn't quote it or anything. I had to go look it up. It says for the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He sends this to me. As I'm questioning whether or not God still has this calling on my life. I'm reasoning with God, trying to be like, okay, I'm in church now. We don't have to do that whole great mission anymore, right? And then my my old, old friend that I haven't talked to him forever reminds me that God hasn't, God hasn't taken that calling away from you. So then I'm like, is this real? I mean, I know the Bible says it, but is it true that when God gives you a calling, he doesn't take it back because I don't know if you've seen everything I've done for the last eight years, Lord, but it wasn't good. Like this is not, you know, who you called. I tried my best to be anything but the person that you called. So I said, I need some, some definitive proof. Because in my mind, I'm thinking like humans think. You've messed up too much. You've failed. You're a failure. You are not called. But at the same time, I was feeling frustration because I knew God did have a calling on my life. But it didn't make sense to me that I could do it in my current state um, of failure. So... I mean, I'm in church for like two weeks and maybe, maybe a little bit more than that. Maybe it was like a month. Uh, I hadn't really even developed a a relationship with anyone in the church yet. I didn't really know. I knew the pastor's name. He knew mine, but he didn't still at this point didn't know anything about my calling or my past, um, or anything like that. So as far as they knew, we were just two strangers that just walked into that church off the street and started going there. In one service, I thought, you know, when they give the altar call, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to pray. And I'm going to ask God to speak to me. I would never heard God's voice audibly before. But I had no doubt that I could. And... um so I went up to the to the front, and during the altar call, I I was I didn't pray this out loud because I didn't want anyone to hear it. I just kind of kept it in my mind. I remember reminding God how He spoke to all of His people in the Old Testament at one point, and and they were afraid of His voice. There was thunder and there was an earthquake and all this, and so they said, "No, no, no, we're scared of your voice." Don't talk to us. Just talk to Moses and have Moses talk to us. And and I reminded God of that story as if he needs to be reminded. And I'm like, listen, they were afraid of your voice then. But I need you to speak to me. 
and I, d I need to hear your voice. I won't be afraid. And then I said, in my mind, I said, speak to me now. Right when the W of the word now left my, uh, not my mouth, but it was in my mind, but it was as if I, if I said the word now, right when the W left my mouth, I heard a voice and it said this, I have not forgotten the dream that I gave you. I've given you a powerful gift and you're going to use it soon. Whew. I'm like, oh my goodness, he's, that was, that's what God sounds like. I'm re like a few thoughts begin to flood my mind. Then finally the thought hit me that I only heard that in my left ear. So then naturally I turned to my left to look and there's a young man there um, who had, who had walked up beside me apparently and spoke those words to me. And I'm talking the timing and the, and the actual words that were said 2000 miles away from anyone who would have even possibly known anything about that dream or my calling or purpose or any, nobody, not even, I was so private about this part of my life that not even my wife knew. And we had been married, I think, three or four years at this point. She did not know that I had ever stood up as a teenager in a pulpit and preached the gospel. She did not know that I had baptized people, that I had taught Bible studies. She knew none of that. I told no one west of the Mississippi River anything about that life. Not one ounce of it. So... Before you start saying, well, somebody told him. No, nobody could have. This guy, I didn't even know his name at that point. I know his name now. I had no idea who this guy was. He had no idea who I was. There was no way he could have known. And, but like, again, it's also not normal for people to just walk up to someone and say something like that in a Pentecostal service without it being from God. I do it now under the under the unction under the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I when God tells me to say something to someone, I do it now. But to just walk up to someone and say, God gave you a dream. I haven't forgotten the dream that I gave. You. Like that's that's not I mean if you're thinking, well, he just goes up and says that to everyone. No. Like no, it's like it was exactly when I asked God to speak to me about that very subject and God did it through the voice of another man. That series of events was enough evidence in my life to number one, know that I'm called to God. Number two, know that there is a God. And number two, to know that, or number three, sorry, to know that I'm on the right path in this life. And it all started because I was hungry for it. I was hungry for the truth. When I first felt God at 12 years old, I started pulling at that thread. When I first got the Holy Ghost at 14, I just kept, I kept at it. I kept, and I truly believe that God has a purpose for everyone. And he's given everyone a measure of faith. The Bible says that. He's given unto everyone a measure of faith. I believe that he goes out of his way and gives dreams to people that need them for faith. He gives visions to people that need them to believe in him. That's what he did with Paul on the, the Damascus Road. He gave him a vision, took away his sight, and then healed him. <laughs> Of the blindness that he just gave him so that Paul, who heard the gospel preached already by Stephen but didn't believe it, he he had to have that extra evidence. If you need extra evidence, God will give it to you. I really believe he will. But he's not going to, 
again, like the detective who's got to investigate a criminal case, you, you've got to go to the crime scene. If you want the evidence, you've got to go out and get it. It's not coming to you. I hope I've encouraged someone today. I hope that wherever your measure of faith was, that it's a little bit bigger now. And as we continue on this journey with this podcast, some of them will be shorter. Some of them might be a little bit longer. But every one of them is intended to increase your faith, even if it's just a little bit. What's your story? How do you know God is real? And if you don't know, how hungry are you to find out? Join us on the next episode of The Measure of Faith, and we will discuss more inspirational stories like this. God bless each and every one of you. I am your host, Jacob Jones, pastor of River City Pentecostals in Decatur, Alabama. Thank you again for listening to this very first episode of The Measure of Faith. Thank you.